Hello, Steven. How's it going? Uh, I'm Daryl Eggs with TechCrunch. We're here in the Thalmic head office. Is this your head office? Your head office, yeah. Right, there was experimental number three, something on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain that briefly? Yeah, I can really talk about the other two places. <laughs> so, um, this is actually this is the third office we've been in. And so we were in a shared office space near the university first, and we were in this like retail storefront, really sketchy for a while, and this is like building number three, so okay. this is uh, Special Projects Facility 3 is the play on the door. And it's a huge place, you've got a lot of room in here, you've got a lot of people in here, uh, you're expanding upstairs, right? We are, yeah, so this is, we do everything under the one roof in here, so we build, you know, the sensors and the, the myotech, all the software, the hardware, supply chain, we've got labs in here, we do all the sort of fundamental R&D and the, the science behind it. Um, and so, yeah, there's just a lot of stuff involved in actually making a product like this, you know, come together. Great. And so, speaking of, so we've got it right here, and this is, which version of the device is this we're looking at? So, this is the Myo Developer Kit. Um, and so, this is what we're just starting to ship uh, at the end of this month. And this will go out to developers that have pre-ordered the Myo Developer Kit. Um, and it represents a pretty significant improvement from the, the very first uh, Myos we showed off. So, we've been shipping what we call the Alpha version, which was a different design. Uh, but twice as thick as this device for the past six months to select developers. Uh, we're now shipping these, the Myo Developer Kit, in greater numbers, and this is the sort of final hardware that the pre-order customers will get uh, later this year. So just for comparison, this is what you were shipping before. Yeah, so Myo Alpha right here, uh, and then the Myo Developer Kit, which is the final hardware here. That's a tremendous so. difference. Yeah, we spent a lot of time to really refine the industrial design um, and build the manufacturing processes to actually make this possible to build and, and ship. And we ended up with something that's quite a bit more robust. You can see the alpha version here had, you know, many different sliding and moving parts. It was made up of this sort of complex assembly of plastics all, you know, attached together. Um, versus this here is really almost one piece. It's you know flexible electronics. It stretches to fit different form sizes. Uh, it's a rubberized. You know, exterior on it, so it's just much more robust and, and also quite a bit thinner design than we used to have, but mm -hmm. have the thickness. And what's the, what's the time between this version and this version? Uh, we started shipping this the end of December 2013, and you know, we're here in, in July uh, shipping this version here, so about six months. Wow, okay. So, so how did you do that that quickly? Was it just a matter of hiring lots and lots of talent? Or? You know what, it's, um, it, it's a hard process. We had a lot of people focused on this problem, um, you know, teams at our manufacturers working with them to develop the new processes we used here. All the through that time, um, but really just a great team here, you know, a great industrial design team, manufacturing team, um, and the labs that we have in-house here helped us actually do that a lot faster, and so we can prototype every kind of revision and change on this very, very quickly, like in a matter of hours from a new CAD model on the computer to actually 3D print or machine something on CNC or put it through one of our test processes here, um, and actually just speed up the iteration cycles, where normally you might have to say, design something, send it out to a contractor, wait two weeks to get it back, three weeks or four weeks and try it. Um, unfortunately, having that in-house enabled us to move really quickly to actually get that to market. This is a first preview of the initial setup procedure that the developer kits will have when they start shipping out. Okay. So this, this is not the consumer version necessarily? It'll be similar, but not necessarily. I mean, we're still a few months away from the final consumer one. This is sort of the first developer preview. Okay, great. Uh, so I'll just click Get Started here. Perform the calibration gesture. So put the band on my arm. Yeah. And the calibration gesture is sort of a, oh, right swipe like that, and that tells it. Yes, yeah, so I know it knows so you recognize miles in your right arm, mm -hmm. uh, so you can just relax for a second now, and then um, it's going to ask you to do it one more time, and the reason it's asking twice is just to have you learn, because every time you put on the device, we don't require any kind of training per person, now it's all to just automatically recognize uh, where it's placed on the arm, which arm. And we do that by a single gesture. It just tells us, is it your right arm or left arm? How does it rotate, etc. Mm -hmm. So you can try and do that one more time here. Um, now it's going to walk you through doing each of the sort of preset muscle gestures. And so the video there showing you the example, so spread fingers is the first one. And after you do that, hold it for a second. We're going to see it to recognize that gesture. Uh, same thing for weight to the right. And then weight to the left, same thing. Uh, making the fist. And then pinky to thumb. So the pinky to thumb is going to have you actually do a few times here, and that's the gesture we use to unlock the Myo. So if you're doing something else, you know, I'm having my coffee and doing a presentation, 
it's not going to accidentally recognize a false gesture. Mm -hmm. So we use the pinky to thumb as a sort of universal enable disable gesture. Because you envision people wearing this like you know, for extended periods of time, not just taking it on and off when they want to use it. Right? Exactly, and a lot of the applications people are interested in are things like presentation, which is one where you're making hand gestures, you're doing other things, you know, you're picking up things. We don't want um, it to accidentally recognize a gesture that you do not meaning to be a gesture. Hmm. So the harder problem for us is not, you know, like false positives and we recognize something that wasn't really a gesture, it's you accidentally did something, you know, you made a fist to grab something, but you didn't mean to control what was on the screen. Mm -hmm. And so we use this automatic kind of locking where the mild sort of goes to sleep, is not listening, and you wake it up by tapping, you know, thumb to pinky, um, which enables recognition of gestures. Great. So now it's going to walk you through doing that a few times, so it's going to tell you to unlock here and it's going to wake to the right, um, which will take you through. So this sample here is, is showing kind of how uh, music control and video control works. So in this case, we're just you know playing a song here, um, and the idea of unlock, and then waving to the right, change tracks, and the same thing, go left to the right. Okay, so now it's locked again. And then we'll do spread fingers, is usually the So that's music control. Um, this next example here is showing some kind of emotion-based controls. This is like turning a virtual knob. Um, so the same thing, you just unlock the pinky and then wave to the right. Um, and now you're going to see this virtual thermostat in this case, but we'll give you the idea of now make a fist, you grab control and just rotate your hand. Um, yeah, you can do that again and just let go. Or, there you go, turn up the heat. Here, so Keynote is one of the, the sort of presentation applications we'll be shipping for consumers, so we've got a, a basic version of that today. Um, we'll allow you to just advance slides, go back and forth by sort of swiping left and right. And so you have to do the unlock gesture, you, you notice the mile will, will vibrate after you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can, after you make the unlock gesture, so just release and swipe to the right, um, we'll let you take control and change the slides. And so all of these gestures, as users and developers are using them up there right now, we collect data on the muscle patterns from those gestures, um, and we use that to kind of refine the whole classifier to enable this automatic recognition on everyone. And so that's one of the ways we've been able to actually have this recognize your muscle activity right now, even though your muscles are different than mine, or different than Samira's or Aaron's here, um, but and you didn't do any kind of initial training procedure, there was no like, you know, do a gesture two times type thing. Mm -hmm. um, we've just taken data from like thousands of uh, different data points to build this classifier out. Because there's a baseline, but there's like a similarity among it, It's similar, but it's, it's similar, but it's still different. So mm -hmm. we have to have, from that initial calibration gesture you did when you first put it on, it tells us where it's rotated, where it is in the arm, but also gives us some clues into your particular muscle anatomy, um, and sort of what type of, of physiology and, and anatomy you might have with your muscles. Hmm. Um, and so we're able to kind of tailor the classifier to you based on that. Is and this something that you guys had to build from scratch, or did you? It did, is. Was there, yeah. there wasn't like existing <laughs> research on that, or no? It's a. It's a. I mean, the research. It's really a lot of the common sort of machine learning tools we use to build that. But the specific algorithms, like to classify that muscle activity, is is very specific to this this product. Um, and it's that's one of the major challenges in getting here. And actually, the fact that we're able to have this work today without you needing to go through that, that training has um, it's been just a huge step forward in, in the, the research in that field. Great. So. A lot of people say, and this is a recent sort of, uh, hardware has become very popular, but now a lot of people are saying, you know, hardware is very hard, and hardware is a lot harder than, than a traditional software startup, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of additional risk involved. So how do you mitigate that risk, and, and how, like, Speak a bit to, to the, the cost of doing something like this versus the cost of building a software business and how that's manageable for you guys. Yeah, hardware is hard. I mean, it's, <laughs> we hear a lot, you know, hardware is a new software, hardware is easy, but hardware is, is very different. It's a different beast. Um, it, it's hard because you're involving, you know, many different um, aspects that have to come together seamlessly. So hardware, really, you still have software. So you still, it's not like we can ignore the software part. We have to still build all that. that. At the same time, we have to build up a supply chain and figure out you know, how we manufacture this, how we test every step of the process, how we ship it, deal with sourcing you know, hundreds of components from 50 different suppliers across the world. And so all of those kind of come together and you get this, the overall complexity just keeps increasing all the way through. One of the reasons that you know, just in terms of how many people you have to involve and the size of the team and the costs, it scales up really quick for hardware because you have all those different kind of 
functional areas that you need to work well together um, that you wouldn't have to build out in a software company. Mm -hmm. So instead of an engineering team that's primarily software engineering where your you know your distribution mechanism is push it to the web and have people download it. Harbor, you have to build up teams that are going to handle like international customs and logistics and like how do you comply with regulations in, in hundreds of foreign countries um, and all those sorts of bits and pieces just keep adding to the complexity. So yeah, hardware is hard. Um, in terms of, of how we made it manageable, um, a lot of the costs that you know five or ten years ago would have been there have come down now. So especially in the prototyping phase, mm -hmm. I think now it's easier to get to from idea to sort of proof of concept much easier than it was five years ago with 3D printing and low cost machining and like all kinds of sort of international manufacturers will do prototypes and so on. Um, but going from like concept to an actual product. It, it's not that much easier now than it was a few years ago. It's, it's still you know, a pretty similar process. Um, it, it's very much a waterfall development methodology in hardware where you know, just the way that those systems work and, and really you have to kind of do things step by step by step and you can't sort of paralyze and, and just keep iterating as fast as you can with, with software. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it difficult as well. Um, and, and just, uh, you know, what, what has been the key to that? Has it just been securing investment? Or, I mean, that must be a big part of your job, right? Good people, yeah, investment. Um, you know, we've been lucky that we've hired uh, quite a bit of experience on the sort of operations and hardware side. Um, if you guys at a Blackberry here, have been tremendously helpful in mm -hmm. setting up those processes and, and just knowing what the pitfalls are going to be. Um, and then I think just having the right kind of team, so having people focusing on all those different aspects and being able to coordinate them towards a common goal, I think has been key in, in making all that happen. Because so you have to align, you know, hardware and firmware and software and manufacturing and like, you know, purchasing and supply chain. All of those really have to be moving, you know, at the same pace and, and all going towards the same goal and come together ultimately for hardware. And to that end, you have this extremely flat sort of office setup where you guys are kind of offices. Yeah, we're just we're as one big room basically. You know, we're all here like software and hardware, like twenty feet apart. You know, not separated by walls or anything. And so, just keeping that kind of collaborative atmosphere across ten different teams, um, I think it's been important in getting there. Good. So, so how close is this to what consumers will eventually receive? So, hardware-wise, this is the exact same. So, this is the units we're going to be shipping. At, you know, in September to create our customers. Um, same same we're shipping to developers today. The only difference is software, and it'll all be upgradable as we go through. So, we just continue to improve the software, push out new applications and so on. Um, but right now we're really focused on the earliest uh, developers, sort of the, the very early adopters, making sure they have a great experience now and they're able to build more and more applications uh, using the biotechnology. Great. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you.